basically these diseases behave like infectious diseases, but there's no, there's no bacteria, there's no virus, there's no parasite, there's no fungus. Nobody could figure out why these diseases look infectious when there's no infectious agent. From the offices of the Weill Cornell Medicine Brain and Spine Center in New York City, this is Your Brain with Dr. Phil Stieg. Internationally renowned scientist and researcher, Dr. Phil Stieg is neurosurgeon-in-chief of the New York Presbyterian Weill Cornell Medical Center. This week, Dr. Stieg and his guest explore tales of a hijacked brain. Hello, I'd like to welcome Dr. Sarah Manning Peskin, a neuroscientist and assistant professor of clinical neurology at the University of Pennsylvania. Today, we are here to discuss her recent book, A Molecule Away from Madness, in which she describes how the very molecules that allow us to exist can also sabotage our minds. Sarah, thank you for being here with us today. Thanks so much for having me. So tell me, why did you write in capital letters this book? What was the motivating factor? I think for the most part, I was thinking of what actually drives the day-to-day -day experience in clinic of seeing people whose minds change. We all sort of have this idea that, um, you know, you could have a broken leg, you could have heart failure, you could have liver cancer, but your identity is essentially unchangeable. That's part of you. What I found in residency and then as I started off after is that that's actually not the case. Yeah, and we sort of depend on this idea that our identity is unchangeable and, and it's controllable. I've always been, you know, quiet or I've always been someone who, you know, loves the outdoors or something like that. But actually, those things can be thrown on their heads uh, and even with just a single molecule. In the book, you refer to the concept of molecules hijacking the brain. What do you mean by that? So what I wanted to capture is the way that these particular molecules essentially hijack identity and personality. You know, one of the stories I tell is about a, a guy who was this extremely successful entrepreneur. He owned tons of different companies and then he eventually started building a company that sold wine. It became this multi-million dollar Goliath. He actually was working with his son at the time and then he started basically being kind of cold to his son. He used to hug his son when they would come to work, and he didn't really seem interested. And then he started being really disinhibited. If he wanted to buy something, he would buy multiple of them. So there would be like tons of DVDs that sprout out of the mailbox, and his wife would sort of be like, you know, why did you purchase so many of the same DVDs? And he really had no insight. He started having trouble at work. There was a meeting early on where they had given him a, a list of finances for February, and he said, well, where's the 29th and 30th? And this was a guy who was just highly, highly functional. And he started having these personality problems. And everyone said, uh, you know, maybe it's related to, you know, back pain and maybe it's related to, you know, ADD or something else. And eventually he ends up with a neurologist who says, you know, this isn't related to any of that stuff. And this is from a single molecule. This is a diagnosis we know. It's something called frontotemporal dementia. And your family history raises some concern that this is actually, you know, from a genetic mutation. And so those are the types of stories I wanted to sort of capture this. What is it like when you go from that process of saying something big and confusing is happening in the real world, and actually there's a microscopic molecular explanation for it? Briefly, you, know, you talk about rebel proteins. What, what is a prion? Prion was this term that was coined by Stanley Prusner, and it's a combination of the word protein and infection. And it was this huge groundbreaking idea in science that came about in the 80s, and it was based on this disease of Kuru. Kuru was a condition that affected what's called the Four Tribes. It was a tribe in the highlands of Papua New Guinea. In the 50s, there was a public health worker that started observing people with the disease, and it tended to affect women and children, and it would cause them to very quickly lose their language, lose their balance, and they would shake, and they would laugh uncontrollably, and then they would die within a year. So it was this very aggressive disease. The guy who first sort of started publicizing it ended up sending off slides, the brain slices of people who died of the disease. And he found colleagues who said, well, maybe these diseases are related. So they ended up figuring out that all these conditions, Kuru and Kreutzfeldt Jakob, are these spongiform encephalopathies. And it's named after the way they look under a slide because it looks like a sponge. It looks like parts of the brain have just melted away. 
basically these diseases behave like infectious diseases, but there's no bacteria, there's no virus, there's no parasite, there's no fungus. Nobody could figure out why these diseases look infectious when there's no infectious agent. And what Stanley Prusner basically figured out is that there is no virus or fungus or parasite or bacteria that's causing these diseases. The infectious agent is actually a protein, which is much, 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 much smaller. And a protein can't, yeah, you know, multiply and divide. So it makes no sense for how it could cause an infection. But it turns out that if you have proteins that unfold, then there are other proteins nearby that will also unfold. And the best analogy was basically a room full of mouse traps where if one of the mouse traps goes off, they all go off. And it turned out with Kuru that the reason why this disease was spreading and looking like an infectious disease was that the four tribe practiced what's called endocannibalism. They would eat their own after they passed away. As part of the practice, uh, the women would eat the brains, and that's where these infectious proteins were. And then they would take the leftovers and give it to their children. And so that's why it had that uh, sort of epidemiologic signature. And, and why you use the term rebel protein, I guess, right? Exactly, because we all have it. So yeah. you know, we're all sitting around with this protein. It's just in some people, this happens. And uh, you know, in some cases, in rare cases, it, it's related to genetics. But in most cases, it's totally sporadic. And we just have no clue why you know, one person develops it and, and most other people don't. One of the diseases you talked about that I thought was incredibly creative, it, just in terms of solving it, was the story about this Mike Bellow, this big strapping guy. It's a cute love story that kind of goes sour, but then comes back. So it's got all the right mixings. Briefly, kind of go through Mike Bellow. Yeah, so um, he was a, a guy who grew up in, in rural Pennsylvania, you know, riding motorcycles, going to high school with this woman who he always had a crush on. But it never, you know, they never quite got together, and they both went off and married other people. And eventually they both got separated and met in the general store in their hometown and started going out again. The relationship developed, and eventually Mike Bellis decided he's going to propose to this woman. He gets a ring, and then things start to change. So his personality starts to change. He was always kind of an easygoing, friendly guy. His Partner sort of described him as like he'd be just as happy at a bar at a black tie event. He's just sort of a nice person to be around. And that starts to change. Yeah, so they go on vacation with friends and he basically puts his beach chair into the sand at the other end of the beach. He doesn't seem to want to talk to people. He doesn't make eye contact. He starts drinking heavily, which took his girlfriend by surprise. And then one day she comes home and she finds he's like on his motorcycle in the yard saying that uh, she might have been a, a spider in his window. So sort of mixing things that don't make sense. And it gets sort of worse and worse and worse. And then eventually they go on this vacation where he was going to propose. And instead he basically punches a wall through the hotel room. So he gets very, very aggressive to the point where she has to sleep in a separate room. And at that point she sort of says, you know, we have to get some help. This is extreme. So he gets admitted to the hospital and he starts having these incredible contractions of the body, almost like tetanus. So it's sort of the disease actually works in the same way as tetanus, uh, where it's just uh, these incredibly forceful muscular contractions. And they're so bad that they actually worry he's not going to be able to breathe. And he nearly bites his own tongue off. He can't control them. So he ends up getting a breathing tube, he gets a feeding tube, and he's hospitalized like that for months. And eventually he ends up at another hospital with someone who happens to recognize what's going on. He's one of the few experts in this sort of relatively rare disease. And this physician basically says, I know what this is. This is autoimmune encephalitis. We actually have a treatment for this. It turned out that uh, what was happening was that the mechanism that the body uses to relax relies on our ability to sense certain neurotransmitters, which are these little molecules that help nerves communicate with each other and communicate with muscles. The one that helps the body to relax in Mike Bellow's body, that one, he was basically not able to sense it. So basically he could never relax. So what we do normally, you know, you lie down at night and you rest your head on the pillow, you relax. He couldn't do that. It was happening both at a muscular level and also at a sort of an agitation level. That was part of the personality change. It turns out it was actually an autoimmune problem. So it's a set of diseases where your body inadvertently makes antibodies that attack yourself. So you actually treat it by suppressing the immune system. And once they started doing that, he actually got better. Yeah, man, he was totally cured. 
So that falls within the autoimmune disorders, right? Exactly. And this is these are a set of disorders that were discovered sort of in 2006, 2007. So they're pretty recent. That's a fascinating story because the body's making an antibody against itself. But then there's another disease where we can actually inflict pain on ourselves. And that's the fascinating story by Korsakoff. Not so much the disease, but the trials and tribulations that he had in proving that he actually found a disease. But Korsakoff was this Russian psychiatrist uh, living in the, the 1800s. And at the time, people knew about this condition called multiple neuritis, where people basically, their, their limbs would get really weak and uh, they would not be able to move. And nobody knew what caused it. Uh, but Korsakoff eventually met this guy who uh, was a, a writer. And like lots of writers, he had was sort of filled with some, some angst, and he uh, sort of soothed it by drinking. He essentially started having some difficulty with memory, and his friends brought him into the hospital and said, you know, he doesn't seem to remember the things that we told him yesterday, uh, whereas you know, a week or two weeks before, he'd been totally fine. Uh, so it was this very rapid change. And Korsakoff starts examining this guy, and it turns out he examines like a normal person at first. He could make an argument, um, he could play a game, so he seems completely normal. But when Korsakoff comes back a day later, the guy has no clue that they've met before. So basically he cannot create new memories. And it's this remarkable alteration of memory that Korsakoff ends up writing up. He basically says, you know, look, no one's really described this change in psychiatry almost, this dramatic change in his ability to, uh, to remember things. Nobody figures out what's going on for, for a long time. And eventually it comes down to the same disease actually affecting lots of people in the Dutch army. So you'd have people who were totally healthy and then they get shipped off. And then six weeks later, they're totally weak and losing their memories. And uh, now that it's a problem in the army, lots of people care about it and it starts getting yeah. you know attention. And uh, <laughs> this guy... It's okay if they kill each other, but they can't die on the job. <laughs> they can't die before. <laughs> so this guy starts trying to study it. And uh, he's working in this laboratory where he's, there's some chickens that are in a coop nearby. Ultimately, the stuff that the guy is studying is totally failing. He's not really making any progress. But he, he starts to notice that there's these chickens nearby who start suffering from what looks like the same disease as these Dutch troops. And the chickens, basically, they start keeling over and dying. Their wings stop flapping. So this researcher, he basically says, you know, oh, maybe I should look at the chickens instead of looking at what I think is going to work. Sure enough, as he's trying to figure out what's going on with the chickens, a few weeks later, they basically get better out of nowhere. And he has no idea what happens, but he suddenly says, you know, maybe it has to do with something that they're eating. So he goes to the cook, who's the one who feeds the chickens, and the cook says, um, you know, look, a few weeks ago, this person came and said uh, that we're going to start giving polished rice, so white rice, uh, to the chickens when it's left over. Um, but then I came in and said, uh, you know, we can't give fancy rice to the chickens. You have to give them the brown rice. And so it turned out, the chickens got sick when they started eating white rice, and as soon as they switched back to brown rice, they did fine. So this researcher very astutely figured out that this disease was caused by something that was in the shell of rice that you basically take off when you polish it from brown to white rice. And he basically figures out that this disease is caused by a deficiency in thymine, which is vitamin B1. So isn't it amazing to you the serendipity that's involved in science? You know, number one, this person actually recollects what Korsakov was describing, recognizes that it's in chickens. The chickens happen to be on the same base as the Dutch soldiers. And you have this obstinate cook on the same base, <laughs> who sort of is the catalyst for all of it. But there's stories of that throughout science. There's like this idea of, you know, for penicillin that, you know, the guy goes on vacation and then suddenly, ta-da, there's, you know, the world's first, you know, effective antibiotic. Part of it also is just not having blinders on, being able to see when something promising pops up that you didn't expect, being able to follow it. For some species of parasites, hijacking their host animals' brains is their ticket to survival. From protozoa and fungi to worms and wasps, these parasites turn their hosts into mind-controlled zombies that serve one purpose, to help the parasite reproduce. If you don't think there's hope for the world, why bother going on? In the HBO series The Last of Us, a fungus called cordyceps infects and controls humans. It has a real-world inspiration, a fungus known as Ophiocordyceps, which preys on ants and other arthropods. 
Ophiocordyceps controls ants by releasing bioactive compounds that short-circuit the ant's nervous system, giving the fungus direct control over the ant's muscles. Once infected, an ant will abandon its colony and climb a tall plant, where it bites down on a branch and hangs on until it dies, perfectly positioned for the fungus to sprout and release its spores. Mind-manipulating horsehair worms, such as Gordius robustus, drive their cricket hosts in a different direction, toward a watery grave. Crickets typically avoid water, but an infected cricket is compelled to find water and jump in. The hairworm wriggles out and swims off to find a mate, while the cricket is left behind to drown. Hairworms infuse their cricket hosts with neurotransmitters, chemicals that send signals between neurons. Researchers suspect this tweaks the cricket's attraction to light, drawing it toward the water's reflective surface. Even mammals are susceptible to parasitic mind control. The single-celled Toxoplasma gondii reproduces only in the digestive tract of domestic cats and other felines. It can spread to other animals that come into contact with cat poop, and it's these intermediate hosts that become Toxoplasma's puppets. Curiously, when rodents are infected, they seem to lose their fear of cats. This makes them more likely to be caught and eaten, sending Toxoplasma back into the guts of its preferred feline host. In this game of cat and mouse, the winner is the parasite. In the book, you refer to four types of molecules, or you characterize four types of molecules that hijack the brain. What are the terms that you use? So I talk about them as mutants, rebels, invaders, and evaders. And mutants are these diseases that are caused by mutations in DNA. The rebels are caused by uh, proteins that have become rebellious. So if we think of DNA is basically the instructions for being a human. Proteins are actually the workhorses of how we actually stay alive. And we, we think that they're going to help us, and most of the time they do, but sometimes they can turn against us. Uh, and then there were invaders. These are small molecules, so they're much smaller than DNA, much smaller than proteins. Uh, and they're not endogenous to us, so it's things that we actually are exposed to or that we ingest, things like medications. These are things that are sort of foreign molecules that come into our systems, get into our brains, and cause problems. And the last was evader. So these are things that are also small molecules, but we really need them to function normally, and we encounter a problem when we don't have enough of them. I've got to tell you that I'm a Lincoln file, and I, I, you know, there isn't a Lincoln book that I don't buy and try to read, and I was particularly surprised by blue mass, your invader that you talk about. So tell me why blue mass is a problem and how it explains some of Lincoln's mood affective disorders. Yeah, so, so I will say this is all still in the realm of conjecture, but there's a, a well-known infectious disease doctor named Norbert Hirschhorn who is reading Gore Vidal's novel, Lincoln. And there's this part about uh, the, the pharmacist referencing given Lincoln blue mass. At the time, blue mass was, you know, relatively commonly prescribed in Lincoln's era. And there's some question of whether he used it for constipation or for depression, because it was indicated for lots and lots of different things. But when Hirschhorn started to look at other sources, there's actually a lot of evidence that Lincoln did take blue mass. The most convincing one is from a colleague of his who quotes Lincoln and basically says that Lincoln told him he stopped using blue mass soon after he was elected to the presidency because he realized it was making him cross. And so it's a great description of one of the most famous people in history having a medication side effect. The main ingredient in blue mass was actually mercury, uh, which was thought to be, you know, a wonderful healer at the time. Uh, now we know better. But essentially the idea was that, you know, we think of Lincoln as being stoic and thoughtful and calm. But actually there's these accounts from before he was elected president where he acts incredibly rashly. There's a story of him working on his final case, and he's presenting this case to the judge, and the judge makes a ruling he doesn't like. And he basically jumps over the judge's bench and essentially like attacks him. So it's these really dramatic scenes. There's another one from one of the Lincoln-Douglas debates where Lincoln gets angry that he's being accused of not supporting the troops, and he literally takes someone from the stage, drags them forward, and like nearly strangles them to the point where his bodyguards have to step in and pull his fingers from around this guy's neck. 
there are these examples of Lincoln not acting very Lincoln-like, at least in the image that we have. And Hirshhorn's idea is that, you know, maybe that's actually from mercury toxicity. Maybe these are examples of this incredible president actually behaving completely differently because of a, a medication side effect. Well, it's interesting because in, in that era, also people took mercury for the treatment of syphilis. So you would have expected more people to have this toxicity and also these affective mood swings, but it doesn't seem to be the case. So that's why I, was, I, I think it's interesting. It's, it's it's great conversation. So hopefully we've given some people some dinner conversation. You know, the nice thing about it is it can't be proven or disproven. <laughs> Dr. Sarah Manning Peskin, thank you so much for taking us through your book, A Molecule Away from Madness, and how our brains can be affected by a change in a simple molecule within them. It's been a fascinating story about disease, but also the history of medicine. Thank you so much for spending time with us. Oh, thanks. It was such fun to talk with you. This Is Your Brain with Dr. Phil Steig is produced for the Weill Cornell Brain and Spine Center by the Really Interesting Picture Company. The episode producers are Hildy Rubin and Liz Witham. The series is directed and edited by Tom Veltri with music by Lenny Williams. The announcer is Mindy Weisberger. Sign up for our newsletter and get access to special episode-related bonus content at thisisyourbrain.com. And follow us on Facebook at This Is Your Brain.